and we'll take a look and see what came of uh, our environmental culture setup. If you recall, a plate was labeled on the bottom and a swab was used after it was wetted. We put this to sample the environment and pick up a sample that we then spread around on the plate. And I decided to make three samples for us to look at. One of them was uh, a 20 minute air sample. And the 20 minute air sample was just out here on the desk in the first video. And the air in here is pretty still. Uh, I do know that there's some movement from the air conditioning, but surprisingly, the plate has nothing growing on it. Uh, certainly that doesn't mean that the air inside of MicroLab is sterile, but it is nice to know that at least it's not blowing around a bunch of dirt and dust. Um, if we had put this sample outside for 20 minutes, which would be sort of a, a control by comparison that we could have put out, uh, typically we would see some growth, um, whether it would be some random mold spores, so you'd have some fungus that could grow in here, maybe some bacteria that are blowing around in the air as well. Uh, so this was a little bit anticlimactic, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing on here growing. Remember, we've only been growing these plates for 48 hours in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna leave this plate over the weekend, but at room temperature, and we're gonna see if more bacteria grow, or, or some bacteria, or maybe some fungi. And so we'll write that down. Additional incubation at room temperature. That's what we're going to do next for five days. So in total, we'll have seven days worth of possible growth on our plates. But before we incubate these all at room temperature, which may give mold a chance to grow, uh, because they grow better at room temperature and they grow more slowly, uh, let's take a look back at my other samples. They're much more interesting than the empty plate that the room air produced. Um, here's a plate that's from my left shoe, and it has a whole lot of growth here that we'll take a closer look at, and also the plate from my cell phone. Ew. It grew a lot as well. And so let's take a look at these uh, a little more close up. I'm going to switch over to the document camera. And we'll zoom in on these. I'll place a black background on here with a dark background. Should provide a little bit more contrast. Wow. So no big surprise in one sense that the bottom of my shoe, which comes in, you know, undoubtedly comes into contact with a whole bunch of dirt and just whatever's around on the ground, um, contamination generally is going to fall down due to gravity, and the bottom surfaces of just about anything uh, in, in an everyday environment is going to be very contaminated. And you can see the vast array of different microorganisms growing here, and, and now they're not so microscopic, they're actually, every one of these colonies, like this little yellow colony, that's, we would call that like a, a small or maybe pinpoint type colony, that represents a million cells. That's impressive. One cell maybe was on there, an invisible single cell, which then grew into a million cells. And that visible colony right there, never mind these massive ones, just that little visible colony may have became visible as early as yesterday, um, over you know 24 hours or less. Uh, really what we need to do is think about what it means um, to make a colony. I'll come back to this because there's so many interesting things to look at. So let's look at bacterial growth for a moment, try to understand it a little bit better. Um, on this slide here, on the first day, I was explaining the term culture, and also 
I believe that we defined the term colony somewhere. Let's see if we can find that. I'm skipping around for a moment till we see uh, the word colony, right? A colony is a visible number of cells that amounts to the millions of cells. And so let's do a little math exercise, all right? If one bacterium takes 20 minutes to double, that's pretty average. So staph, like that little yellow colony, is probably a staph uh, skin type of bacterium. Um, or E. coli, ordinary gut bacteria, about once every 20 minutes under ideal conditions where they have plenty of food and space to grow and 37 degrees warmth where they can grow their fastest at human body temperature, um, then that means that they're going to be able to multiply three times an hour. So how many doublings would it take to go from one invisible cell all the way up to, let's say, a million, okay? Now, think this exercise through in your head. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and establish, um, I'll just use this as a blank area for, uh, for this purpose. I don't have it pre-prepared, but it shouldn't be that difficult. We'll do it, well, perhaps, why don't we just do this in our heads? So how many would it take to go from one cell uh, how many? How long would it take to go from one cell to two cells? So that's 20 minutes, right? Okay. So then, two cells double after another 20 minutes, and they become four cells. Okay. The way I want to count this out is let's do it by generations. All right. So one generation um, gives us one. Generation two gives us two. Um, for one generation, we go from one to two, okay? Uh, next generation, you go from two to four. And then third generation, we go to eight, right? So three doublings. And then fourth generation, eight becomes 16. And then uh, fifth generation, we now have 32 bacteria. And then 32 doubles to 64. And then 64 doubles to 128. And then 128 doubles to 256. And, and then 256 doubles to 512. Maybe some of you are familiar with these if you think of exponents or like doubling. Uh, computer parts are sold this way, right? So 512, um, that's nine generations. And then double that and you have 1024. So just over a thousand bacteria after 10 generations. Um, 11th generation, that would be um, 2048, and then after that you would have 4096, and then after that you would have 8,000, uh, oh my gosh, what would it be? 8,000, can't remember the exact number, but let's not try to do all that math in our heads. Let's round it to 8,000, that'll be easy enough. And then we have 16,000. And after we, that oh, was 8096. I remember it now. Then 16,000, um, we'll just round it. 32,000, 64,000, 128,000, 256,000, 512,000. Now we're at a half a million. And then one more doubling, that makes 20. We're over a million again. We're, we're, we're up to a million. Okay. So after 20 generations, um, you have a million bacteria. And that happens well within the first day. And so on our Zoom meeting, I'll go back and I'll try to remind you of this little part of my video. And we'll, if, why don't you, I'll ask you guys a question, which is how long does it take to get 20 generations? How many hours is that? So think about that. Exponential growth will produce invisible bacteria into these unusual colonies or however they're shaped and so I want to go back to that plate and analyze the colonies a little bit. So guys back on our document camera we can see that um, all different shapes and sizes of colony growths occur. Some have color. Uh, there can be orange, there can be yellow, off-white, um, you know sometimes you'll even find red or uh, pink and there are even purple bacteria, but they're just not that common. Now, most bacteria you can see are white. And uh, a lot of 
most bacteria are also opaque. They have a milky color to them, um, but occasionally you'll see bacteria that are uh, clear, um, you know, translucent. And uh, one thing I would like to tell everyone is if you do an experiment like this where you sample the environment, you have no idea what you're growing. Um, we could be growing something as dangerous or deadly as Bacillus anthracis. Uh, cloudy colonies that look like this are usually Bacillus species. So it's not a good idea to open these plates. We don't know what these mystery bacteria are. And when they're in their invisible amounts, most of the time they're harmless. But now we're growing these bacteria that, are, that could be harmful into large numbers. These are huge numbers that could represent an infectious dose if you were to accidentally come into contact with them. So I'm gonna recommend um, in an experiment like this that we never open the plate. But I do want to flip the plate over so that we can at least look at uh, what the plate looks like or what the colonies look like uh, from the top side. We do have an issue though, which is that the, that the lid is cloudy. I'm going to go ahead and go into the biological fume hood uh, in the other room and swap this lid out with a clear lid so that you can see this more closely. Uh, I'll be right back in a moment and we'll continue the analysis of these colonies. So here's the plate now with a clear lid so that we can see through it. And I can zoom in even further and I'll see if turning the light on helps. It does help a little bit. And we can really see these colonies from the top side as they are growing up from the auger nutrient jelly-like substance on the bottom and then growing up towards you. They look like usually little dome-shaped uh, structures. Depends on how what species they are and, and how they grow, but you can see the different colonies. Some colonies are shiny. Other colonies are rough and dull looking. Bacillus species typically are rough and dull looking. Uh, Bacillus anthracis can be most readily identified by growing these cloudy, rough-looking colonies on blood auger. And when you grow them on blood auger, they actually look like fried eggs that can peel up at the edges of a fried egg, like it's in a pan, but it's on blood auger. And if the edges lift off and it has a fried egg appearance, um, it could very well be uh, a deadly organism like Bacillus anthracis. So again, I'm being very careful, but I wanted to at least take a look and see about all these different organisms. Um, the organisms that are off-white, small, smooth, round, regular in their appearance are usually skin bacteria. There are a lot of skin bacteria, even on the ground, even on the bottom of your shoes, because, I don't know if you've heard this before, but it's estimated that in an environment where people live, that the dust inside of places uh, that are human dwellings or, um, or whatnot, that the dust is like 70% skin cells. Oof, it's kind of gross to think about, but those skin cells have bacteria stuck to them, and so dust commonly does carry bacteria, um, even from that one event, but uh, dirt in general, very contaminated. Um, these bacteria that are irregular in size are typical of soil-based bacteria. This looks like a soil sample, and there's no surprise that with a variety that comes from a soil sample, it would just look just like the bottom of my shoe. Let's compare that to my cell phone. So the cell phone, okay, I'm gonna try to get both in the picture. My cell phone has a surprising number of bacteria, no question, I, that's not exactly ex, uh, like a good thing in my mind. I mean, yes, I know that we have bacteria all over us. You need to be aware of wearing like a suit of normal flora bacteria all over your skin. But your cell phone or whatever it is that you commonly touch, door handles, keyboards, you name it, uh, we call those objects fomites. And I'll spell that out for you, uh, what if, you know, F-O-M-I-T-E in our lecture. And what you'll see is, is that when you sample fomites that are common use items, they look just like a skin sample. So if I took uh, a sterile swab and wiped it on my skin, and then put it on the plate, which we'll do later in the course. So we'll get a chance to see this kind of result from a straight skin sample, but this is what it's gonna look a lot like. 
this irregular looking colony here, um, I have no idea what that is. We can take a closer look at it. Um, I don't know how that popped up. Who knows? You know, maybe there was some dirt on my uh, on my cell phone. I mean, you know, that definitely is possible, right? Let's take a look. I'm kind of just uh, trying to get a better look at it top side. Wow, that's pretty fascinating, you guys. Um, if you look at this colony, it has these strange. I don't know how to just, I'm trying to think of the, the right term here based on what I'm seeing. When you look at it off camera, just directly, it looks like it's waxy. And these waxy type growths are usually from um, unusual species of, of fungi. Um, there's a species called trichoderma that looks like that. And think about it, trichoderma. So it could very well be a fungus that comes from the skin. We have some fungi as normal flora as well, just not nearly as many as the bacteria. Um, so oh, maybe I have some trichoderma on my skin. But the only way I would be able to identify these more certainly um, would be to put them under a microscope and actually look at their structures. Uh, we're going to do that later in the course. For now though, we're just taking um, kind of a broad look at this. And speaking of a broad look, you can see all around, situated around this weird waxy one, that there are all these fairly similar looking colonies of bacteria. And those are what staph bacteria look like. All right. Um, one of the staph that we're going to be using today is called Staphylococcus epidermidis. And Staph epidermidis growing in this slant is the most common skin bacterium on all humans. So. Every, it's what it is to be human. Just like we all have E. coli in our gut, we all have some staph epidermidis on our skin. Our book's author for our textbook, Tortura, says that as many as 90% of the bacteria that grow on your skin um, are just 90% staph epi. So that's a really important and beneficial bacterium uh, when it's on your skin, as opposed to say staph aureus. Um, which can also be normal flora, but we don't like the staph aureus because it makes, you know, it causes disease in many instances, whereas most of these are probably harmless bacteria um, that fall into the staph epidermidis category. All right, that's enough about that. We're going to incubate all of these over the weekend, as I was mentioning, um, at room temperature, that uh, they're going to be incubated for longer. So I'm going to leave these out for room temperature incubation. We'll check back on them one more time um, during our next video. And let's move forward. There are many other things to do. Uh, as Just as a reminder, guys, um, you can look at the different um, vocabulary terms. I'm not asking you to memorize them, but even that, like, for instance, that waxy one, it was definitely irregular in its colony shape and I would say that it had a irregular to maybe perhaps a filamentous kind of appearance and also waxy which isn't listed on here um, and so you can get these different uh, vocabulary terms there's a good uh, reference for you guys uh, see, here's an example look at this so here's a picture from your lab manual showing mixed soil sample growth and it looks quite a bit like the bottom of my shoe as that sample was or commonly students will swap the bottom of their handbag or their purse or something like that backpack and it'll look a lot like this um, here are the colonies of bacillus anthracis and they it's a little hard to see on here but these do have the so-called fried egg appearance um, because there's a central like a center that looks like an egg yolk. And um, that raised area looks like that. As we see here, it has a really unusual term called umbani. That's actually my favorite vocabulary term to describe all of these. It's just so unusual, umbani. Um, but it, that's what Bacillus anthracis looks like. Um, and this is growing on blood auger. Here are some different varieties of pigments that bacteria can have um, 
or you know many different microorganisms can have these uh, unusual colors to them. So uh, there you have it. By the way, I mentioned Klebsiella pneumoniae in my in my uh, lecture uh, earlier, and you can see that Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is one of the causes of pneumonia, the fluid buildup in the lungs, has a mucousy, sticky kind of um, what is called a mucoid surface and that's because they stick really well to the lungs and unfortunately that makes them very difficult for um, our lungs to fight off. There's uh, your immune cells called alveolar macrophages as we'll learn about phagocytes as they're also called. We'll try to di ingest and digest these bacteria and they have a tough time with these sticky mucoid colonies when they're in the lungs.